Hello everyone, this is Kathy from RPL. Reading Public Library misses you, and we think you might miss us too, or at least getting book suggestions from us. So some of the reference staff banded together to come up with a few titles that might hold you over until we meet again. Kind of a literary lifeline. Sometimes when things are uncertain, it helps to spend time with an old friend. So I'm currently spending time with my old friend, Olive Kittredge. I don't usually reread, but after finishing Olive Again by Elizabeth Strout, I realized I needed to go back and spend more time with the unlikable yet endearing Olive. Set in the fictional town of Crosby, Maine, these 13 linked stories introduce us to an unforgettably human character and the people who surround her. For even more Olive, treat yourself to the Olive Kittredge HBO miniseries. It's rare that you can claim a movie is as good as the book but in this case, it's really close. The Olive books are in overdrive in ebook and audio format. Lorraine, what are you reading? Thanks, Kathy. Um, the book that I just picked up is The Goldfinch by Donna Tart. And it's been on my shelf forever, really since 2013. It's almost 800 pages long, so I kind of had it tucked away, but now is exactly the time for a long and complex book. I really just started, but here's what I know. The Goldfinch was a national bestseller and won the Pulitzer Prize in 2014. It follows the life of Theo Decker from his early teens into his late 20s. The book is told in five parts and begins with a feverish adult Theo hiding out in a hotel room in Amsterdam. The story moves back and forth in time and finally circles back to explain why Theo is now hiding. The Goldfinch in the title is a painting that Theo acquires under traumatic circumstances and it maintains a hold on him throughout the book. If you'd like to take a deep dive into art, into the art world and explore how the pain of loss can change a person's whole life trajectory, read The Goldfinch. This is also uh, available as an ebook and audio book. We'll be sure to let you know about all the books, whether they're available digitally and if you have any questions about how to access them, just visit our website, readingpl.org. And at the end of this session, we'll put up a list of all the books we've talked about. So don't worry about getting the name just right now. Eileen, what do you have? Thank you, Lorraine. So my first book is Memoirs of a Geisha by Arthur Golden. This was written in 1997. It's a beautiful historical fiction novel that takes place in the time period around the Second World War. It's the story of Nita Sariuri, a beautiful but poor girl with unusual blue-gray eyes. At the age of nine, upon her mother's impending death, she's taken from her home in a poor fishing village and sold into the renowned geisha house in Jiayong, Peyote. Despite a miserable and arduous apprenticeship, she becomes one of the most successful geisha requested at all the tea house parties. This is a world where grace, charm, dance, music, decorum, and the proper pouring of sake is of the utmost importance. It's a story that's heartbreaking, romantic, unforgettable, and ultimately triumphant. And it held my interest from the beginning to the end. You can find this book on Overdrive. Then, if you would like to read a nonfiction account about Geisha, I recommend Geisha, A Life by Mineko Iwasaki. Iwasaki wrote her memoir in response to Arthur Golden's book, which is based on her conversations with him. She wanted to set straight some of the misrepresentations in his book. In a memoir, Iwasaki covers her career in the secret and mysterious flower and willow world until her retirement as a geisha at the age of 29. And you can find this book on Hoopla. Okay, Andrea, your turn. Okay, I'm gonna start with a couple of books. Um, we Ride Upon Stick Cornberry. Almost 300 years after the town of Danvers, Massachusetts hosted the infamous 1692 witch trials, a new coven rises to power. In 1989, Danvers school falcons are the bad news bears of field hockey. Until one full night, they take a pledge to the dark side in an Emilio Estevez spiral notebook. This raucous coming of age not follows them as they dominate the season. 
read this if you like 80s pop culture, low street, and teenagers on a tear. Um, all of my books are available digitally. This next one, though, is not available through Hoopla, Overdrive, or Libby app. Um, it's you have to buy it digitally. Um, if you're in the mood for a slow burning, creepy read, then a good man by Ani Katz is just what the doctor ordered. Thomas Martin is a good man, or so he thinks. A devoted husband, a doting father, a dedicated son and brother to his mother and eccentric twin sisters. He is an excellent provider and protector for all the women in his life until he destroys everything. Kathy? There's been a lot of buzz about the debut novel, Valentine, by Elizabeth Wetmore, and e-versions are available. This intense book with a strong sense of place explores the aftermath of a brutal rape in 1970s West Texas. Early one morning, 14-year-old Gloria Ramirez appears beaten and barely alive on the front porch of Mary Rose Whitehead. The teenager had been viciously attacked in a nearby oil field. This act of brutality will be tried in the churches and bar rooms of Odessa before it can ever reach a court of law. Told through alternating viewpoints, this character-driven novel centers around racism and sexism. Someday book groups will meet again, and this would be a great choice. It's gritty but compelling, and there's a clear reason why this book became an instant bestseller. Next. My next book is Writers and Lovers by Lily King. I love Lily King's writing. Her language is so well crafted. It's mesmerizing. Casey is a 31 year old writer slash waitress. She's been working on her novel for six years. She lives in a garage, uh, works at a posh restaurant with difficult co workers, and has just ended a short but passionate relationship. Most of all, Casey is suffering a deep loss from the sudden death of her mother. She's heartbroken, has little family and friends to cheer her on. But Casey refuses to give up on her passion for writing and her struggle to find a promising relationship. If you like beautifully written stories and enjoy a realistic character who finds their own way, you will love, love writers and lovers. Also, this story is Boston-based. She lives near BU, uh, works at a restaurant in Harvard Square, and uh, bikes up and down the Charles. And this is um, available on Hoopla, which means it's always available, no waiting. Okay, Eileen. All right, and this book is completely different and unlike the world of Geisha. This book totally lacks refinement. Nature Girl by Kyle Hyacin. Honey Santana is a single mom raising her 12-year-old son Fry in a trailer home in Florida. Life would be easier if she did not always have not one, but two songs singing simultaneously in her head. And it would help if she did not feel morally compelled to teach the not so moral a lesson. That's why we find her basically kidnapping the rude telemarketer Boyd, who interrupted her dinner time with her son. Honey lured Boyd and his mistress Jeannie down to Florida for a supposed echo tour. But this is one kayak tour that was never going to go smoothly all complicated by the fact that her stalker boss follows her and he's being followed by her protective son and ex-husband who still loves her, if only she wasn't so wacky. Add in one detective hired by Boyd's wife and one Seminole Indian trying to escape civilization and a college girl who has the hearts for him and you get a recipe that only Cal Hyacin can make. If you're looking for a quick, light, totally lacking refinement, perhaps offensive humor, but full of offbeat quirkiness, then look no further than Nature Girl or any Kyle Hyacin book. And you can find this one on Overdrive. All right, Andrea. Okay, this is another new book. How do rich and powerful men like Harvey Weinstein, Matt Lauer, and Donald Trump get away with predatory sexual behavior for decades with minimal skill and no criminal consequence? Both a spy thriller and a meticulous work of investigative journalism, Catch and Kill, What Spies in a Conspiracy to Protect Predators by Ronan Farrow, exposes the machinations of such a man while never losing the voices of the many survivors in her this fast-paced book. 
Farrow's reporting helped take down one of the most egregious rapists of our time. Wine is currently serving 23 years in jail, thanks to the bravery of the victims and Farrow's persistence in the face of intimidation. If you're in the mood for a page turning stranger than fiction tale, this is for you. And if you're looking for readable nonfiction, try Talking to Strangers by Malcolm Gladwell. The prolific Gladwell is famous for combining social science research with narratives and turning it into a work with wide appeal. In this book, Gladwell provides mountains of evidence to demonstrate that we humans are awful at reading people. He discusses several instances of how making assumptions can lead to terrible consequences, citing Fidel Castro, Bernie Madoff, and Hitler. Since the day we were born, we've been warned about talking to strangers. Gladwell argues that maybe if we learn how to talk to strangers, we could avoid some of the conflict in our world. If you're a listener, Gladwell produces the audio version and uses music and actual interviews to really bring the book to life. Both versions are available on Overdrive. Lorraine? Mute. Sorry about that. <laughs> Next up for me is Eight Perfect Murders, a Boston-based mystery by Peter Swanson. Years ago, Boston bookseller and mystery lover Malcolm Kershaw compiled a list of the genre's most unsolvable murders, those that are almost impossible to crack, including Agatha Christie's ABC murders and Patricia Highsmith's Strangers on a Train. He titled his list, Eight Perfect Murders, and he posted it online. No one is more surprised than Malcolm, now the owner of the Old Devil's Bookshop in Boston, when an FBI agent comes knocking on his door. She's looking for information about a series of unsolved murders that look eerily similar to the killings on Malcolm's old list. And the FBI agent isn't the only one interested in the bookseller. The killer is out there watching his every move and the killer clearly knows way too much about Malcolm's personal history, especially the secrets he's never told anyone. If you've read anything by Swanson, then you know that his protagonists always have a secret or two. So if you're looking for a relatively quick read with Boston connections and lots of links to the thriller genre, check out Eight Perfect Murders, also available as E and audio. Um, Eileen. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so my next book is Our Man in Havana by Graham Greene. You should dream more, Mr. Wormold. Reality in our century is not something to be faced. That's Dr. Hasselbacher to Wormold while drinking their morning daiquiris at the Wonder Bar in Havana. For Wormold, dreaming is like selling another vacuum cleaner so that he can support his precocious 16-year-old daughter, Millie, who dreams of having a horse she, she'd name Serafina and of belonging to a country club. Certainly, his dreams did not include becoming a spy but desperate to support his daughter Millie's lavish lifestyle, and indeed, she does get a horse, Wormold succumbs to the pressures and the paycheck of a very persistent British Secret Service agent, Hawthorne, and Wormold becomes their man in Havana, agent 59200-5. Thus begins Wormold's web of lies, inventing sub-agents and creating reports with blueprints of the Cuban government's elaborate missile site plans. But on second look, the blueprint looks like a giant vacuum cleaner. To quote President Coolidge, once bamboozled, impossible to unbamboozle. The British Secret Service did not see the humor in Graham Greene's book written in 1958 during the Cold War, but perhaps you might. You can find this book on Hoopla. Milkman by Anna Burns is set during the Troubles in 1970s Northern Ireland. The titular Milkman is not actually a milkman, but a 40-something IA paramilitary. He sets his sights on the novel's 18-year-old heroine. As he stalks her, secrecy, gossip, and the police state set a menace tone. Yet absurdity, wit, and glimmers of kindness soften every scene. 
Read Milkman if you enjoy literary fiction. Better yet, listen to it. It's read by Bryn Brennan with a gorgeous Irish accent, perfect for a wee bit of slang. Kathy? If you like your family dramas set in the scrub pines and sand dunes of the Outer Cape, you might want to be on the lookout for The Second Home by Christina Clancy when it comes out in June. A dispute over inheritance brings up a long buried memory for a pair of sisters and their estranged adopted brother in this debut novel. At 35, Anne Gordon is in the painful process of selling her family's summer house in Wellfleet after her parents are killed in a car crash. Unable to find a will, she tells the realtor what she assumes is a harmless lie, that besides her and her younger sister Poppy, there are no other heirs to the title. But of course, that is not a harmless lie. Check out this edgy bee tree chock full of family secrets for your next trip to the Cape, or maybe your next trip to the couch. Lorraine? Thanks, Kathy. Uh, the next two books I am going to talk about, Overstory and uh, My Own Words by Ruth, ba Bader, Good <laughs> by Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, are on my to-read list, so I'm going to be reading those next. My Own Words by Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, it starts in 1946. Ruth Bader, a 13-year-old eighth grader and editor for her school newspaper, wrote a column. It's the first piece in this collection and was a sign of things to come. While other students wrote about the circus, school plays, and the glee club, Ruth discussed the Ten Commandments, Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights, Declaration of Independence, and the United Nations Charter. My Own Words is a collection of essays and speeches that explain, in Ginsburg's own words, the beliefs and goals that drove her decisions and her experiences both before and after she became a Supreme Court Justice. It includes essays from her childhood and college, tributes she gave to other judges, legal briefs and statements Ginsburg made on gender equality, and writings and speeches she made while she served as a Supreme Court Justice. Beware, this is not a memoir of Ruth Bader Ginsburg's life. It is a collection of her writings. But if you want to know more about the notorious RBG, it's a great place to get started. The second book on my to-read list was um, Overstory by Richard Powers. It was recommended by, by my good friend, Pat. If you love trees, you'll love this book. It's a work of fiction, really a collection of stories that connect people who have or develop a passion for saving trees. It's the story of nine people all woven together. They come from different places, occupations, ages, levels of passion. Their unique life experiences with trees bring them together to address the destruction of the forest. By the end of the novel, some are in prison, some are dead, and some are still hiding in the forest. That's the overstory by Richard Powers. Andrea? All right, my final book is the Pulitzer Prize winning Frederick Douglass Prophet of Freedom by David Blight. It's been sitting on my to be read pile since it came out in 2018. It covers the life of an American legend, an escaped slave. Douglass was a brilliant writer, orator, abolitionist, suffragist, and Christian. John Gardner, writing for The Guardian, says, this is a monumental book, a definitive biography, rich with the biblical cadences that filled Douglass's life and imagination. Slavery, redemption, vengeance, justice. These were Douglas's themes. Read this if you want inspiration combined with heavy lifting, both intellectual and literal. Thanks, okay. Andrea. While um, I'm going to have Eileen share with you um, how you can join in the fun of sharing what books you like. And while she does that, I am going to share a screen so you can see the list of books that we talked about today. Um, it's all yours, Eileen. Okay, thank you. We, we are going to have two programs, one on May 5th at 10.30 a.m. and another one on May 13th at 7 p.m. You can come to one or both. It's called Let's Talk Books, and it's going to be one hour of virtual book sharing. To start off the hour, I will tell you about three or four of our new eBooks that the library purchased, and you'll find them available either on Overdrive or Hoopla, and then it's your turn to share what you're reading. You can 
just listen or you can share, but your book recommendations will help make this hour a success. Registration is required. So go to our calendar on our website, May 5th, May 13th, and we hope to see you there. And let's talk books. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Um, so long, we'll be back. Bye.